The diaspora of Dushayu's dead gorillas spread to Melbourne. The museum possesses the stuffed remains of three Western lowland gorillas, representing a small gorilla family, mum, dad and baby. McCoy had purchased the specimen sight unseen on the premise that their display would visibly demonstrate to the public at large what Owen had tried to achieve through brain anatomy, that the gulf between human and gorilla was so vast that common ancestry and common nature could not in any way be shared, or at least not shared between Europeans and the great apes. McCoy was always eager to add to his collection, and he had a dealer in England, Edward Gerard Jr., from whom he purchased many specimens that would take their place in the museum. He had become aware of Dushayu's discovery, perhaps through reading his 1861 travel yarn, the expansively titled Exploration and Adventures in Equatorial Africa, with accounts of the manners and customs of the people and of the chase of the gorilla, crocodile, leopard, elephant, hippopotamus and other animals. McCoy got onto his dealer, demanding gorillas. Gerard was finally able to oblige McCoy, writing to him in December 1864 to inform him he'd been the happy recipient of the gorilla family, which were then shipped to Melbourne and arrived in June 1865. As they did everywhere they went, the gorillas caused a sensation. According to the Melbourne paper, The Argus, in a single week over 700 people have visited the museum, a dramatic increase in numbers that could only be explained by the new exhibits. Almost certainly the manatee specimenism acquired at the same time was not the main draw. The fact was that the world had gone gorilla crazy. And a significant part of that craziness related to their connections, or not, with Homo sapiens. In explaining his rationale for acquiring the gorillas, McCoy was explicit that the exhibit was designed to settle the Huxley versus Owen debate in the minds of the Victorian public. Indeed, to demonstrate that the anatomical gulf between humans and apes was, to quote McCoy, impassable. There was the expectation too, quoting McCoy again, that the theological question of man's place in nature would be resolved by the exhibit. McCoy used Halford's comparative anatomy of gorilla and human feet to illustrate just how impassable the gap was and how Huxley's own osteological analysis of the structure of the feet and hands was irredeemably flawed. McCoy would spend the rest of his life resolutely maintaining his anti-Darwinian views and therefore continuing to insist upon the exceptional nature of human nature. During his time at Melbourne, not a single copy of Darwin's work was acquired by the museum's library. When McCoy was sent a copy of Origin by the Australian bookseller Ferdinand Bellier, he returned it. In 1869 to 1870, he would give two public lectures of, according to the historian frame, several hours duration, where McCoy, speaking as a paleontologist, denied authority, either in the scripture or in science, for belief in the gradual transmutation from one species into another. For him, species were immutable, they appeared and became extinct, and something, or rather someone, replaced them with new acts of creation. The two lectures were published in 1870 as the Order and Plan of Creation, which took a day-age view of a creation directed and ordered by a sentient creator. Human nature forged in the image of God had to be protected at all costs from the breaking down of the species barriers that was implicit to Darwin's theory. How could this have happened? How could McCoy have been in a position to promote what seems in retrospect outmoded ideas? Well, there was certainly nothing backwards about Victoria. In fact, quite the opposite. During this period, it was on the cutting edge of modernity and McCoy's and Halford's views were never uncontested. The editor of the Argus, Edwin Wilson, who was active in scientific and acclimatization circles during this period, was a convinced Darwinian and in later life, on returning to Britain, became a close neighbour of the great man himself. Within a generation, these ideas disappeared. The men who replaced McCoy and Halford were altogether more committed to an evolutionary framework. I'm thinking about folks like Baldwin Spencer, who became Professor of Biology at Melbourne in 1887. And it's also quite clear 
how it came to pass that rabid anti-transmutationists dominated the university from the 1850s to the 1870s. It was all a matter of recruitment. Both McCoy and Spencer were recruited directly by Paleites from the Paleite world. But what an interesting story. Hopefully, our close relations, the guerrillas, will be back once the World War I commemoration is over. And if they're not, I, for one, will be campaigning for their return. For they tell us so much about how high the stakes were when radical biologists suggested that man and animals came from common stock and therefore shared the same nature. The business of integrating the human species with the animal kingdom, thinking, feelings and all, seems clear cut to us today. Of course we are related to the apes, and to the dogs, and the cats, and their wild forebears, and to any other organism we care to name. We live in a cladistic cosmos where common descent is the scientific orthodoxy about our place in nature. If Darwin was, is revolutionary, then this is one of its revolutionary aspects. We should rephrase that. If evolutionary theory, transformism, transmutation, call it what you will, was revolutionary, which it clearly was, then this blurring of the boundaries between species, this breaking down of the wall between humans, apes and others, was a foundation stone of the revolution, perhaps the foundation stone. At the same time, this making humans animals was a direct assault upon the creation stories that are at the heart of Judaism, Christianity and indeed Islam. Here, an omnipotent and possibly omniscient figure, Jehovah God, Allah, etc., creates the world, populates it as he sees fit and creates a special kind of being, man, is completely different to all other life forms. For a start, he's created after them, but definitely not an afterthought. God was working to a plan. More importantly, he gives the human species dominion over all other life forms to use as he sees fit. Man and his helpmate, woman, are therefore differentiated in pre-Darwinian theology from every other species. Mankind was not, as some have insisted, halfway between the angels and the apes. He and she were, in fact, more angel than ape. And had it not been for that unfortunate incident with the snake and fruit, from a biblical perspective, that's how it would have remained. The biblical worldview, once it was meshed into Aristotelian science with a dash of Neoplatonism, created a dominant cosmology that lasted the best part of two millennia, the great chain of being. In classical times, it was called, in Latin, the Scala Naturae, literally the ladder of nature. You can find it in the works of St Thomas Aquinas. It's in Shakespeare. I even have references to it in the work of the anatomist Charles Bell in the early 19th century. And you find it too in the 1860s and 1870s in the lectures of our old friend Frederick McCoy. It was definitely a cosmology that had legs. By the Middle Ages, the chain had coalesced into the form it carried for the next 300 years or so. It put forward the idea that everything in nature was connected hierarchically, linked together in a chain which was ordained by God. God was, of course, at its head. Below him, the heavenly hosts, from seraphims at the top to the angels at the bottom. And the link below the angels was man. Man was ordered in a natural hierarchy too, kings and popes at the head, nobles and priests below, and of course below them the commoners, the peasants, occupying the lowest rung in the scale of mankind. Women were, of course, subordinate to men. And then another radical break to the animal kingdom, and so it went on, with the higher links having divine sanction over the lower links. This was a model of pre-enlightenment power. Popes over kings, kings over nobles, nobles over peasants, men over women, man over animals, predators over prey, animals over the plants that sustain them, the plants over the minerals that offer them sustenance. Thus, everything was linked together. 
There were four principles of the chain. Each one of them brought succour to the McCoys of the world, although he had to do a bit of contortion to justify the acclimatisation of non-native species. Firstly, there was gradation, which we've already seen. The issue of power and authority. McCoy said in 1870, you will see how it is that a complete chain, as it were, of organic beings from the very lowest to the very highest may be in some measure expected. Secondly, plenitude. God has populated every niche of creation. Niche is the important word here. Everything is fixed in its place. McCoy apparently saw his acclimatisation work as completing God's plan, looking for empty niches in Australian ecology that could be populated by the importation of European species, which was a kind of heretical view and required some logical jiggery-pokery. When you examine, let us say, the animals of any country, suppose you take those of South America, for example, and endeavour to arrange them systematically, man and monkeys at the top, and then going down to the very lowest living creature, you will find that many of them follow in such exact succession that admiration is excited at the beauty and continuity of the chain. Still, you find now and then great breaks in the series. You find a gap between parts of your chain. Now let's reflect here. How can that be? Surely an omniscient God couldn't have stuffed up, but no, it appears part of the plan. But the marvel is, McCoy continues, that when you go to look at some other country, you find many of the creatures that were wanted to fill up your gap, to make up your perfect sequence, or to fill in the gaps in McCoy's logical chain, you basically complete God's work for him, which he knew all along because he's omniscient. So he knew that you would do it. Hurrah! The other two principles are already illustrated in the quote, and I will leave you to extrapolate them from there. Thirdly, continuity. Each is linked to the other. Fourthly, sufficient reason. Anything that happens does so for a definite reason. The reason here being God. It's easy to look at this stuff and think, that's crazy. How could a man of science who was able to do major work in classifying species, who was adept at paleontology, who understood the structure and function of organisms, extant and extinct, who was professor at a university, whose life overlapped with Darwin's, how could that man hold fast to a cosmological view that found its roots in Greek philosophy and medieval theology here, we have to cast aside anachronism. Firstly, as Steve Fuller points out in his book on science and religion, the two could actually complement each other. The McCoy view was really quite good at discovering stuff about nature. For example, Linnaeus's taxonomy of the animal kingdom might have organised animals into a table, but his orders were very much based upon the scale of nature that was integral to the chain. More concretely, individuals like Charles Bell were driven by their religious beliefs. As the Lancet sardonically said of him, aping his Scottish brogue, he never touches a phalanx and its flex attendant without exclaiming with uplifted eye and most reverentially contracted mouth, Gentlemen, behold the wonderful evidence of Dizin! and yet, driven by his attempts to understand God's plan, was able to contribute significantly to mapping the nervous system. The same was true of Owen. In fact, it was particularly true of Owen. The fact is that comparative anatomy, the branch of anatomy that explores the analogies and homologies between the different parts of species, was driven by this worldview. A homology between parts, the hands of a human and the hands of an ape, indicated proximity on the chain. An analogy between parts, the arms of a human and the flippers of a whale, was seen as being a result of functional needs. In the whale's case, how God had designed the whale to swim in the ocean. So McCoy's view wasn't necessarily a drawback to doing effective science. The second point is quite simply that the model of common descent was very much a threat to the special nature of human nature. It undercut the powerful idea that we were special, that we had souls, that our nature was fundamentally different to that of the animals and to that of the apes. 
which was why Desheu, McCoy, Halford and all those others were at pains to demonstrate how different the gorillas were in their nature to human beings. It was imperative that they be portrayed as beasts. In some regards, Darwinism was a much greater threat to human nature than Lamarckism. Lamarck's orthogenetic descent implied that man remained the crown of creation, more complex than any other species. But the branching descent of Darwin implied that we were just another mammal, albeit one that had evolved incredible powers. And one of those powers was altruism, the capacity for self-sacrifice for the benefit of others. And in exploring the issue of altruism, we are taken straight to the heart of sociobiology, the theory that was promoted by E.O. Wilson during the 1970s and has influenced many fields, including evolutionary psychology.